Lord, thank you for my sisters here, and thank you for their hunger to learn and their hunger to uh, just desire to want to become more and more like you. I pray in our session right now that you'd keep me from error, that I would only speak truth, and that I would honor you. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Okay, listen, I love your questions. I'm not entirely surprised because these are the good ones that you get anytime you get a QA. and a and, and I would just tell you, these questions, many of them, what I'm going to give you, I'm going to try to go quick so I can get to all of them. And if you have follow-up, we're small enough, just raise your hand, you know, if you're okay with that. And if, if something doesn't make sense, all right, we'll go till 4 or until I run out of steam, which may be in like 10 minutes, okay? But uh, uh, what I'm going to try to give you... the quick version, which is very hard for me, okay, because mouth, um, I just want to give you all the explanation, uh, but if I don't answer it, I just want to let you know you're more than welcome to sit in on class, those of you that didn't drive for hours and hours and hours this morning that live far away, uh, you're, you're welcome, or my email is cfinch at truitt, finch like the bird, at truitt.edu, if you want to follow up with questions, I am always glad to have a dialogue with you, so just just know that, and okay, here we go. Do you have something? All right, okay. They're kind of general categories, so let me try to hit them in some kind of order. And and I, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you my best understanding of scripture. When we talk about women in ministry, and that's what most of these questions are about, the position I hold is that there are quality with some distinctions. And for someone who holds the position that I do, I think the burden of, for us, if you're in that same camp, is on application. Meaning like, how do we apply this verse today when we didn't have youth pastors in the first century? So the burden is on faithfulness and application. I don't think interpretation is as big a stumbling block because the Bible says what it says. For, for those, you may be in here and you may think that the Bible teaches equality, same as I do, with no distinctions. And I think if, if you are in that position, a position I held a long time ago, then the burden for you is on interpretation, on how do you understand the Bible say something different than what it's saying. My, my mamaw who I talked to earlier when I graduated high school, I took a Greyhound bus. Oh, it was horrible because <laughs> uh, people had been on it for a long time, and there were a lot of smells, okay? Uh, but I took a Greyhound bus from, Pen uh, from Tampa to visit her in Pensacola, and I spent a week with her eating and talking about things, and I remember her saying many times she would go, Candy Baby, it says what it says. And I, I can hear her saying that in my head. Candy baby, it just says what it says. And so some of these passages, like the first one we're going to turn to, it says what it says. And so if you don't like what it says, <laughs> then you, you, you can take it out with God. But you, if you have, a like I do, a, you know, a, a thing in your spine that twitches a little when you hear certain things, then remember the posture should be it's good news. And if it doesn't feel like good news then lean into it, understand, okay? Because uh, God loves women, he loves you, I love you, let's dig in. Okay, the first question is, if a woman is not permitted to teach a man, how does this apply to youth ministry or in a co-ed class? And I'm just going to, there's two on here. If a woman is gifted as a teacher, can this gift only be used to minister to other women and children? So... There are several other on this vein, but to under to, this is a question identify is about application. Okay, did you catch that? If a woman is not permitted, that in quotes, so whoever wrote this is referring to First Timothy chapter two. So we got to look at that. Before we can ever talk about uh, application, we have to rightly understand what God's word says. So the for all of us in answering these types of things, understand what God says, and then think about how to faithfully apply. So 1 Timothy chapter 2, and why is the book of 1 Timothy, why was it written? Let's see who was paying attention. What? How to do church. Yeah, we read that. 
And so we, we just spent some time in 1 Timothy chapter 3, but one chapter over, we get a passage on how we engage in ministry in the church. It's not the only passage that refers to women in ministry, but it's the one that for many women is a stumbling block. It, it, or at least I'll say it was for me at a, at a time. My, it seemed unfair. I didn't like it. Uh, but it's God's word, so it's good news. Okay? So to get the context of 1 Timothy, let's, we'll, we will lead up to 1 Timothy 2.12. 12. He's talking about in verses 1 through um, uh, 6 uh, about how we engage in church. So he's talking about how we pray, how um, that we should pray for those in authority, that our desire should be to lead a tranquil life because it pleases God. And, and he gives a little testimony in verses 5 and 6 about who God is. In verse 7, he says that I was appointed to tell, you know, I'm a herald of the truth, an apostle, uh, and a teacher of the Gentiles in, the, in faith and truth. Okay, then we get verse 8, and he gives some specific instructions to men. And um, this is important. Another one of the questions is how do we know what applies just then and what applies like all the time? A, a way to put this is how do we know what is a, a timeless principle versus just a timely applica application of the principle, okay? Have that in your mind because we're going to come back to that. So he says in verse 8, therefore I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Does this mean he's, t he's giving specific instructions to men and how they pray in church, how they do church? Does this mean that the only proper way for men to pray is with their hands raised? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. What do you think? You're shaking your head no, several of you. Why not? You're, you're definitely getting to it. Yes, absolutely on the right track. Um, one thing we want to see is we, when we're understanding a topic like prayer, okay, we want to not just use one passage of Scripture. We want to say, what does the whole Bible teach us about this? And so the whole Bible teaches us some things about prayer, the importance of prayer, the importance of worship, and we see different postures of prayer in Scripture, okay? Sometimes raising hands, sometimes kneel, um, flat on the face. You know, there's different postures. So we don't want to apply this and say the only way to, to pray in worship is with hands raised, but there, did you catch what he says? He says, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. So there is a way in which you pray in church. The way specifically men, does this mean men, I mean women, aren't supposed to pray in church? No, okay? But at least in the church in Ephesus, because this is where he's writing, this is where Timothy is pastoring, we don't know if we had some unruly, unholy anger, you know, angry men. We don't know, but he's writing to them and saying to Timothy, instruct them to do church this way. They are to lift up holy hands that may have to do with their character qualities but without anger or argument it could be that there were some people engaging in ministry or engaging in worship that were doing so that were doing so out of anger or just to just to get a little argument started in the church and and for whatever is going on he's saying that's out of bounds men a specific word to them when you engage in prayer it should be without anger, without argument. And, and, and so he's given a specific instruction to the men, and then he switches to women here, okay? And, and here's the thing. We don't know if there were specific things happening in Ephesus, just like with men. We don't know. And listen to me, sisters. We don't want to go beyond what Scripture says, but we do want to stand firm on where Scripture stands firm, okay? So he says also women are to dress themselves in modest clothing, with decency and good sense, depending on your translation, I know we've got several in here, it's going to have a little different, right? 
right there, but he says, not with elaborate hairstyles, gold, pearls, or expensive apparel, but with good works as is proper for a woman who affirm they worship God. I like the translation that says it's proper for someone who professes godliness, professes God. I love that. Uh, so does this mean I'm wearing pearl earrings? Oh, candy, you haven, you know. Uh, uh, no, because if we were to say he's saying we should not wear any kind of jewelry at all, he's telling us how we should be clothed is with good works. So if you walked in here jaybird naked, but you were doing good works, uh, that, Paul's not saying, well, you're right in line there. <laughs> um, but he's saying that what matters is not about the outward appearance, it's about your character, okay? And, and so he's saying, so, now we don't know this, you'll read commentaries and someone will say there were women in the church at Ephesus that were distracting because they looked like, this is my version of it, hoochie mama. You know, they were looking like they're dressed, dressed in like loose women. It could be, I don't know. Or some people say they, there were women that were looking like very ostentatious. They were putting, it, there were some at the time with very elaborate hairstyles, and he refers to that, and they would put gold jewelry and, 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 and jewels in their hair. And just imagine if they walked into church on a Sunday morning and then just fashay, all eyes would be on them, okay? In the same way, when a man prays, it's not about him, it's about God that they're worshiping. In the same way, when a woman comes into worship, it shouldn't be about us, okay? I, all I should not go, Whoop. it's about God. A woman who professes godliness, what should be important about her is her character, not the outward appearance, okay? Then we get verse 11. A woman should learn in silence and full submission. Does this mean a man shouldn't learn? No, but there, for whatever reason, there's a specific instruction to women here. Don't miss out that he's saying a woman should learn. Okay? There, there has been some really, let, let, this is why I think these passages are so misunderstood because good, good people of faith have twisted this and misunderstood it and misapplied it. Okay? There was a time, and I've heard people say this, that women, you don't know. You don't need to know what you believe. I don't know where they get that in Scripture, okay? Jesus encouraged Mary Martha to learn, right? Paul is telling women to learn. Women have been affirmed that are learning and thinking about their faith. Like, you need to know your faith, all right? Um, so he says a woman should learn in silence. That word for silence there is not the Greek word for shut your mouth, okay? It's a, a word that means it's a... Uh, a, 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 an attitude that you are not combative, but you have a silent attitude, a quiet spirit. First Peter 3 talks about it. There's a passage in 1 Corinthians 14 where it says a woman should be silent, and it means she should shut her mouth, okay? It, it d literally means that. That's not this word. So she should learn. Go ahead. This Gathering or, or excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what is happening? <laughs> What's happening? I hear myself. Yeah. But they were disruptive. Yes. And Paul did not mind them learning. He just wanted them properly dressed, not to draw attention, but also not to erupt the and disrupt the uh, services. Yeah. And the teaching. And I think that's what, that's what he meant. He wanted the quietness. Yes. It could be. So some people say there were rowdy women at, at uh, Ephesus that were being disruptive in the same way there were some rowdy men that were being disruptive when they prayed in argument and anger. We, who knows what's happening in that church? It, it could be that. I want to say, though, I want to caution um, uh, that's so good because when we get to 1 Timothy 2.12, what some people say is the reason that that verse will say it doesn't apply today is because it was only at Ephesus where you had those disruptive women. And good, yeah, you know, you know, that's right. Um, but yeah, so, so it could be there were some women that were being disruptive. I have been in churches where there are men and women that are disruptive, okay? Uh, and, and I'm sure if Paul were writing to that church, he, I don't know that he'd name call, but he would say, stop it, you know, stop it. And so he's saying that that's how you should learn. That's, and I'll get you in just a second, how else can we learn, sisters, without 
a quiet attitude. The word for submission is a dirty word today, but it's a beautiful biblical word. Submission means where you willingly place yourself under someone's authority. How else are you to learn from God without willingly placing yourself under his authority? That's how anyone learns, man or woman, okay? I see that hand. Well, in the starting with verse 8 where it's talking about the men with holy hands without anger and all that, to me it's, it's still another disruption. It's just the men are maybe disrupting one way, the women are disrupting a different way. Either way, whichever way you're doing it, that is what we're looking at is we want to be able to learn without disruption. Yeah, that's a good overriding principle. We even see this in the church at Corinth. Okay, We know there's a specific disruption happening in the church at Corinth. Uh, they're exercising their spiritual gifts, and they're doing so in a way that it, it's like a madhouse. Okay, There's two specific gifts in chapter 14 they're talking about, the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy. And, um, and Paul says God is the author of order and not confusion. He says, let all things be done decently and in order. So when we do church, when we gather together as the body, it shouldn't be a madhouse, okay? It should be to focus on him and on ourselves. And if we're doing anything that causes someone else to be distracted, then we are not putting the goals and interests of others in the world, okay? So then we the lead up to verse 12. It says, I do not allow to teach or have authority over a man. Instead, she is to be silent. That word silent as well is the attitude word, hesukia. Okay, it doesn't mean she's to shut her mouth, but there's it's talking about her attitude within church, okay, her, the character quality. Now, much ink has been spilled over understanding these verses, okay? Some people say there were rowdy women at Ephesus, there were false teachers at Ephesus. And that's why Paul is given these two prohibitions. A woman's not to teach a man, and a woman's not to have authority over a man in the church. And, and so people will, you know, I told you, candy baby, it says what it says. A lot of people want to make it say what it doesn't say. But what it says is that women in church are not to teach men or have authority over men, okay? Um, and some people, why, well, why does Paul say that? Were there rowdy women? Were there false teachers? Let me just illustrate. Whatever reason you hear, we go back to the word of God. Were there false teachers in Ephesus? Yes. Specifically in 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, uh, 2 Timothy um, and 2 and, verse one, and, and chapter 1, Paul named some false teachers their men. So if the reason is that there were false teachers, why doesn't he give the same prohibition to men, okay? Some people say, well, there are women that were just not, they were not educated. And so women were not allowed to teach then, but now women are educated. You know, more women graduate from college every year in the United States than men. So that's why. But that's not the reason Paul gives. Paul actually tells us why. He gives us a little bit more details. He gives it to us in verses 13 and 14, okay? He says... For, or because, the reason I'm saying this, for Adam was created first, then Eve. Let me pause there. What Paul is doing in this passage is he's pointing us back to what we call the creation order. Back to Genesis 1 and chapter 2. For whatever reason that he gives us, it's not just Paul's opinion. He says, the reason I'm saying this is because what happened back at the beginning Genesis 1, we see the full equality and essence and value of men and women, both equally created in the image and likeness of God, both given the command, uh, you know, to exercise stewardship over the earth. But in chapter 2, we see the uniqueness between men and women. Men, um, uh, Adam was given the responsibility of tend and keep in the garden. Before Eve ever came on the scene, she was specifically created with a beautiful purpose. Why? to be a helper, an exer connecto, to Adam. That was her purpose. And so Paul says, the reason I'm going to point you back, God had a plan and a purpose. You may not get it. You may not understand it. But Paul is saying there was a design from the very beginning before sin ever entered the world. Okay? 
At, and then in verse 14, he points us to Genesis chapter 3. That verse 14 has be, been grossly misunderstood and, and used to harm women in the past. So let's dig in and see what it says. He says, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and transgressed. So verse 13, he points us back to Genesis 1 and 2. Verse 14, he points us back to Genesis 3. Now, for much of church history, you're like, you're giving a long answer. This is important because a lot of your questions had to do with this. In Genesis chapter 3, we see sin entered the world, okay? And for much of church history, Eve has been painted as the, the, the great harlot who allowed sin to enter the world. As a matter of fact, some church fathers, if I shared their names, they may sound familiar, thinking about one in particular that called Eve the devil's gateway, through whom all iniquity entered the world. I mean, just some really mean things, okay? I love Martin Luther, uh, uh, the church father. He was a little salty, and I like him. Uh, but he said some really bad things about women, and then he got married, and it got better, okay? Katie Luther, praise the Lord for her. Uh, courageous man, uh, uh, man of God. But he had some wrong understandings about the doctrine of women, Okay. There has been some wrong teachings. Who does the Bible hold accountable for sin entering the world? Adam. How do you know that? That says it somewhere. That's right. In Romans and in 1 Corinthians, Adam is held responsible for sin entering the world. Who took a bite of, it doesn't say apple, but the fruit. Who took a bite of the fruit first? Eve. And so for most people, they've interpreted that to mean sin entered when she, when she was deceived in that moment in eight. She was deceived. It, I, if we had time, oh, I'd love to go through Genesis 3 with you, but we don't have time, okay? Uh, but it, it's such a tragic moment. The, what we fall in the same pattern that Eve does, okay? She entertained the enemy. She didn't recognize the enemy for who he was, and she started contemplating what he said. She was deceived in that moment, okay? I think... When we look at this and we say, oh, well, they're spanking Eve here. No, I think it's a condemnation on Adam. Adam, who was given the responsibility uh, to care, and guard, he's just standing by and allows his wife to take a bite. And then, and then he as well, he did not exercise spiritual leadership in that moment. And so he wasn't deceived, and he sinned anyway. You see that? This is what happens, what Paul is telling us in verse 14. This is what happens when we do not obey the Lord and fulfill our responsibilities that he's given us. He gave Adam spiritual headship. We see it in Genesis chapter 2, and we see it in other places of Scripture. And in that moment when he should have protected his wife, she's responsible for her own relationship before the Lord, okay? If you're married, it doesn't mean like, I can do whatever I want. It's my husband's fault. No. Um, but, but he was given that spiritual headship role, protect, and he blew it. He just stood by and let his wife be deceived. And so verse 14 is actually condemnation on Adam and not Eve. And what happens when Adam did not fulfill his role? And so Because for whatever you believe, Paul is saying to us, this prohibition that I have given, it doesn't have to do with a woman's worth or value, her skill set, her spiritual gifting. It has to do with how God designed things at the very beginning. And and you may think, like I did, oh, it's not fair, you know? Like you look at guys and you think, I could teach him under the table, you know? Like you, you could bring the thunder. It has nothing to do with ability. God says, the way we do church, we're going to do it my way. The way we do a family, we're going to do it my way, okay? I'm going to pause there. So that's my understanding. Whatever you think about 1 Timothy 2, I think it's, we can't say it's only that church at Ephesus. I think it's a timeless principle because it points back to Genesis. It says this prohibition is grounded in what happened at the very beginning, okay? So, how do we apply that today? Well, it's important. There's two prohibitions, teaching men, having authority over men. There's a context. What is the context? Church. Say it with power, ladies. Church. So, the application has to do with church, okay? So, the question was, if a woman is not permitted, and this is not Paul's opinion, you know, 
he's pointing us back to Genesis. To teach a man, how does this apply? I love the way this is phrased because you realize it's an application question to youth ministry or co-ed classes. Let's take one after another, okay? Youth ministry, when does the boy become a man? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some of you are still wondering. You know, like, yeah, <laughs> when he marries, he's 30 and living in his parents' ba- 40 maybe. Like, uh, yeah, you all are getting a sense of what g- women's feeling right now. But uh, I get to defend my kind? Or? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Dussault is making sure I don't say anything heretical here. That you know, oh, sorry, Dr. Dussault. Okay, listen. We today in our contemporary culture, there's a lot of different ideas about when a boy becomes a man. But to understand scripture, we want to first understand it. It's an original context. So, in the first century, a boy became a man um, around his bar mitzvah, around the age of 12 or 13. Okay. The idea of adolescence, I love working with teenagers, but that was a foreign concept in first century. Actually, for much of our history, the, the idea of adolescence didn't it actually emerge until the 19th century, this you know, half adult, half youth kind of concept. Um, I, I, am, I love youth ministry. I, I think there's, I love people that invested in my life. My life changed when I was in high school. Um, but too much of youth ministry teaches children um, as if they're little kids, but they're young adults, okay? So how do we apply? In Paul's day, it probably would have been around that age. When it's talking men, he was probably talking around a 12 or 13-year-old, okay? In our day and age, what about youth ministry? When I first uh, started in ministry, my first ministry job was working on a church staff in college. I worked for my youth pastor Uh, to do girls ministry. That was my job, to hang out, build relationships with girls, and disciple them. We, for several years, did a thing called Oasis, where one Sunday a month, we would have all the youth uh, together after church, and he would teach and I would teach. And and I didn't question it. I just, you know, he asked me to do it, and so I, I did it. But then I started thinking, hmm, what do I think about youth ministry? And, and then I came across this passage, and I thought, how do I apply it? And so this is for me, okay, because I have to give an account to the Lord for how I faithfully apply his word to my life. You have to wrestle it with yourself. When I started having a, I I call it a pause in my spirit, whatever you, you know, an itch in your (laughs) giddy up or whatever, I, I started questioning, is this right for me? And at that moment when I was not sure, I stopped doing it. And, and it took me probably two years. I'd think about it and chew on it and meditate, think about the, the cow chewing its cud. And I just don't know. And so I, I wouldn't do it. And after about two years, I became convinced that because of what I understand the first century would have been, and honestly because I, the way I approach youth ministry, I think we should treat teenagers like young adults. So I want to model that. So I do not teach middle school or high schoolers, a a mixed setting, Uh, for me personally. Now, I have some godly friends that do that. They, they, you know, do the cutoff at college age ministry. And some people say it's out after they get out of college. But for for me, as best as I can understand the original context, it would have been about that age. And that's okay for me. You know why? Because I love investing in teen girls. Okay. Now, does that mean I never uh, advise a guy in the youth group or have input? No. Okay. I, I have uh, guys that will ask me questions. I happen to know a lot about the gender passages in scripture, and so I have conversations all the time with the youth guys. But um, I have chosen not to teach uh, any, any time. And I've been asked, okay, I, I've been asked, I don't say that in a prideful way, but once you settle something in your heart, just wait, <laughs> just wait, because all the opportunities to test whether you, that conviction will come up. And so for me, I say no to that because, um, because I, I, in my mind, that's teaching young men. Whether it's Sunday school or big church or whatever you talk, we don't have all the, we didn't have all these different ministries, but in the church setting, I personally choose not to teach once they get to middle school years, I don't do that. So what about a co-ed class? I actually wrote an article about this several years ago because I get that question all the time, partly because there are so many faithful women in our churches that have a hunger for God's word and a willingness to serve him. I, I don't say this demeaning towards God, but we have more women that are willing to step in 
into the gap and that are teaching. But when it comes to Sunday school, how do we apply it to that? Because Sunday school isn't big church. Well, we didn't have discipleship group, and some of your churches have home groups and all of these different settings. When it's under the guise of the ministry of the church, I, that's where I have drawn boundaries for my own personal life. So in a mixed setting, whether it's happening on a Sunday morning or in a small group um, at, in someone's home, if it's through the ministry of the church, I, I think it's out of bounds, okay? And, and, and I'm happy to talk about that more. Then you may ask application, because some of you ask, well, what about like parachurch organizations, college ministries and that kind of church? Uh, and that kind of stuff. When we think about the application of 1 Timothy 2.12, the context is important, the church. And so when we think about wisdom, there are some things in Scripture that are clearly forbidden. You're not supposed to grumble and complain. And I wish there was like a setting, but it's like a blanket. No grumbling and complaining, okay? Out of bounds, completely out of bounds, okay? And there are some things we're commanded to do, forgive, okay? And, and then in the middle of this, we have some things that are commended but not explicit that you have to do and some things that are called foolish, some things that are called wise. We apply the principle of wisdom. So for me, um, Romans 14 has been very helpful as I think about application. If there's something that I think will cause someone else to stumble, then I don't, then I don't do it. Um, even though I, it, or if I have a pause in my spirit, because Romans 14 is talking about food uh, offered to idols. You should mark that down and read it. Very helpful for me and very freeing. It says, if the one who doubts eats, like if you're not sure if you should be eating and you do it anyway, to him it is sin. So for me, if I'm not sure whether it's inbounds or out of bounds or wise or unwise, and I do it anyway. What I'm saying is, I don't know what you think, God. I'm just going to do it anyway. And, it, and it, you, you may be fully allowed to do it, but if you're saying, I don't know what God thinks, I'm going to do it anyway, the attitude of your heart is not God control. It's, it's your own control. And so, well, as you're weighing this, I don't know about you. Maybe you're a quick decision person. <laughs> It, it, I, every time I've thought about a different application, I've had to mull it over. Okay? It took me two years when I was thinking through youth ministry. And so think about, but when you're not sure, don't do it anyway. Okay, Because the Bible calls that out of bounds. It calls that sin. Okay. Um, the next question on this one, and you're like, oh, that was so long. But so many of the questions have to do with that. So if a woman is gifted as a teacher, and I... I Y'all may not think so after this. I think one of my spiritual gifts is teaching. I love it, love it, love it, love it. Um, some of you have that spiritual gift, okay? The spiritual gifts, this is really important, that we see spiritual gifts outlined in several places in Scripture, in Romans, in Ephesians, in 1 Corinthians. There may be some other places. Um, uh, but whenever we see spiritual gifts, they're not segregated by gender, okay, like, only men have the spiritual gift of teaching. We, it, you don't get any indication of that in Scripture. So, if a woman is gifted as a teacher, can this gift only be used to minister to other women and children? I, I want to say, if we're, we're talking in the church setting and you're thinking about teaching uh, in, in a Sunday morning or you know, in, a, in a church ministry, then I would say yes, but I would, I would say yes, not only Look at all the women and children you can impact, okay? Praise Jesus. Women are worth the impact of your life, worthy of the investment. Now, this is where um, we don't want to go beyond Scripture, okay? So if my, my dad, I, I have a Ph.D. in systematic theology, okay, in historical theology. My dad is a lifelong learner. So while I was working on my Ph.D., he started reading a theology textbook, and he would read a chapter and then send me questions and we would discuss it. And I didn't say, no, Dad, you're a man. Um, we can't discuss that. Be because we can have spiritual discussions. But the truth is, the one-on-one -on -one conversations that I had with my dad and I have with other people that I have with colleagues, uh, is, but I, that same discussion I wouldn't have in the church, not because I don't think I'm able or gifted, but because I want to obey the Lord. And for whatever reason, whether I understand it or not, he has said, when we're in church, we don't do this. So um, we have a good example of this, okay? Remember when I told you the difference between narrative and didactic passages? 
we have a narrative passage that talks about Priscilla. You know who I'm talking about? Priscilla and Aquila. They were a missionary couple, and they traveled around. They were tent makers. They were business people. And um, it talks about, first, I think it's 1 Corinthians, where um, Apollos does not understand the full gospel. Okay, So he comes and preaches, and it's good. But it says Priscilla and Aquila took him aside and explained the way of God more accurately, more fully to him. Now, we don't know who took the lead in that discussion. Uh, there are some commentators that say Priscilla did it because her name is list listed first. We don't know. That's an argument. <laughs> We're going a little bit farther than Scripture says. But, but it says they both took him aside and explained the way of God more accurately. So I think there's a place when it says your gift of teaching can only be used. There's place for discussions. I learned from colleagues and brothers in Christ. They, they learned from me. Are, are you, uh, we were, I was talking with Dr. Dassault for his communication class, his how to teach the Bible class. And one of the things that we do at my church, the, the young men that are the youth leaders, um, they take turns speaking on our, at our youth service on Sunday mornings. But at, they will, at the end of that, talk, get all the youth leaders together and ask for input. So they, they learn from us and we learn from those. So those discussions, I think, are in place because God wants to use us to advance his kingdom. But we just need to do it in biblically appropriate ways. So, so I would say in church, I wouldn't say the only way, and I think there are a lot of ways that God can use your spiritual gift to build the kingdom. Okay? But in the church, don't teach men. Don't have authority over men. Don't do it because I said it. Because I believe you have to wrestle with on your own. Okay, on that same line, the, the question says, the issue of women pastoring and preaching is, growing, is a growing controversy. Some people are saying it's okay for a woman to preach as long as she doesn't pastor. Others say a woman can speak to a large group, including men, about the Bible without actually preaching. As someone conservative on the role of women, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what the Bible says about this. I'm going to give you a quick answer, but just know I spend a lot of time in class unpacking this, so I'm glad to follow up. The words teach, preach, um, speak, um, prophesy. Before we can apply, we understand what the Bible says about that. When I told you about deacons, you know, and I said I'm stepping into it because it's a controversy, because we use the word deacon today in a way sometimes that I don't think always accurately reflects the biblical understanding, okay? When we hear the word preach, what do you think? Pastor, pulpit, yeah, pulpit, preacher on a Sunday morning, big church, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, when people hear the word preach today, that's what they think. Biblically, the bi preach is a biblical word. It means to proclaim. And so you, ladies, are to proclaim the good news, okay? Uh, you are to do that. I, I like to call it bringing the thunder, okay? Uh, and that's my favorite definition. I have a friend, he likes to call it shucking the corn. And, uh, you know, whatever you call it, all right? Preaching means proclaiming. We are to proclaim the good news to others, to share our faith, okay? But when we, in doing that, when we think preach, we think what happens on a Sunday morning, the, what, what are the boundaries for us? Whether you believe it or not, what did I just say? The Bible indicates some boundaries for women. Teaching men and exercising authority over men, which is another whole lot. But on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night or whatever, whatever you think, okay, whether they're behind the pulpit or not, what is happening in a normal church service? What is that? What's going on? Teaching. Yeah, it's, it's teaching, okay? We call it preaching, but the Greek word for teaching means to instruct, and that's what's happening, okay? So, I lost the question. I think it's out of bounds for a woman to preach on a Sunday morning the way we talk about preaching, okay? I think that's out of bounds because that's instruction. Do I think it's out of bounds for a woman to proclaim the good news? If I leave here today, or let, let's see, I flew on a plane here. I was seated next to a, a man. Do, do I think I am encouraged to tell him the good news? Absolutely. Okay? Yeah, absolutely. And, and biblically, that's actually preaching, but we use it a different way. Okay? 
So some people will say, in all fairness, this is a convoluted, people make it so confusing today. Some people will say, well, the woman is allowed to prophesy, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we're not going to take time to look at it, but if that's another passage we actually spend like three hours in class digging into. It's about head coverings. But it says in there, if a woman prays or prophesies, it's a distinct word from teach, speak, or preach. It's, Paul says if a woman prays or prophesies, she's supposed to do so with her head covering, and it says because of the angels. What does that mean? Um, but if you look at the beginning of 1 Corinthians, it's talking about, it is assuming that a woman can pray or prophesy in the church. Okay, So some people say what we call preaching today, okay, not proclaim the good news, what we call preaching is actually prophesying. And so a woman can prophesy. But as a matter of fact, the word prophesy biblically had a very specific meaning. Okay, And as a matter of fact, when we look at all of Scripture, okay, I'll see that hand, I'll come back to you. Uh, when we look at all of Scripture, there are women that are called prophetesses. Anna's called one, okay? Hulda is called one. Miriam is called one. We don't know a lot about Anna, okay? How, or the, the daughters of Philip are called, uh, four daughters are called prophetesses. We don't know a lot about the New Testament and ministry of that, but in the Old Testament, when women, Deborah is called one, when women prophesied, they exercised that function, that role, in a distinct way for men. They either prophesied just to women or privately, okay? So you can take that for whatever it's worth, but the way they exercised that gift was in a distinct way. The word prophesy can mean foretell, meaning like to tell the future, <laughs> you know, something is gonna happen, um, or it's, it's what we think about, what'd you say? It can mean, well, uh, exhort, uh, only because that's, it, it can mean that, but it actually, it, it can mean that, um, that God has sent you to not only like tell the future, but actually to talk about something that's happened in the present. And um, it, it's a hard, some people jokingly say that people that only see black and white and that are a little harsh, they have the gift of prophecy. You know, we, we don't know that, but the, the prophet had no authority on his own. If you look in scripture, when a prophet came on the scene, whether it's a woman or a man, they said, God said, thus saith the Lord, okay? They were just kind of like a microphone. Is this thing on that God used to deliver his message? So we do not have in our contemporary churches what our understanding of prophecy, whatever it looks like, I think has been misunderstood because we, we have the word of God today, okay? It's a little different than in New Testament and Old Testament times. So here's how I tell people to apply. If a woman were to read scripture, I think she should, okay? She should do, do it in a way that affirms her unique design as a woman, okay? If she prays, I think women are allowed to pray in the church, okay? But when it gets outside of that, reading scripture, uh, or giving a testimony about how God has worked in their life, I think that's all in bounds, okay? That while there are some boundaries, there's so much that women can do within church ministry. And unfortunately, sometimes in wanting to um, not go beyond scripture, we've drawn the boundaries in ways a little bit too tightly. So can a woman teach, let's use the word teach, on a Sunday morning? If she's giving her testimony, I think that's great. Now, some people give a testimony and... They are, you know, can you learn? Yes, but they're unpacking scripture. That's a little bit different. Um, and, and that's so, you know, you have to weigh in what they're doing. Uh, are they saying it's a testimony, but they're really, you know, <laughs> instructing and, and uh, unpacking the word of God? The word for didasco in, in 1 Timothy 2.12 is actually has the sense of unpacking doctrine, okay? And so I think a woman can do that. Now, about... Uh, so some people are saying she, it's okay to preach as long as she's not a pastor. Well, the problem is we do have 1 Timothy 3, but we also have 1 Timothy 2. And so the Bible doesn't say a woman's not only, you know, that's the only boundary. She shouldn't be a pastor. Does a pastor teach men and have authority over men? Yeah, by very nature. I think why, I, I know who asked this question, I think that why this is coming up specifically within Baptist circles 
is because if you're not Baptist, this won't make sense to you, but if you're Baptist, especially Southern Baptist, we have a statement of faith. It's kind of like what we circle around as we, as we co- cooperate together, okay? And because there was so misunderstanding about the role of women in ministry, in 2000, ba- Southern Baptists revised their statement of faith. And you're like, what? <laughs> Be, to add that the office of pastor is reserved for men. And so there are a lot of Southern Baptist pastors that say, well, as long as she's not a pastor, she can do anything else. But the truth is, what's our authority, ladies? Say it, say it with confidence. What's our authority? The word. the word. That's right. So, yes, I, I think it's out of bounds for a woman to be that overseer pastor role. Um, but that, there's some other things. Listen, there's some boundaries for guys, too. Okay, We're focusing on some things that are boundaries for women. But there's so much that women are to do. And we looked at some incredible ways that women minister today. So uh, I, I, I think that there are some churches today that are erring. I love them, brothers and sisters in Christ, but I'm grieved for them because they're pointing to the Baptist faith and message and not the Bible, okay? That statement of faith is based on the Bible, but it's important. It's a minimal um, standard of what we can cooperate on. It's not exhaustive. It wasn't meant to be. And so there's misunderstanding today about that. Okay. Then... Oh, I forgot. That's right. Sorry. It's kind of repetitive, but just no, for understanding. Yeah. So someone like a speaker like um, Sadie Robertson or Beth Moore, have they pushed it or by evangelizing that far? <laughs> no, that's a good – okay. No, that's a good – I always want to be charitable and not um, not peak, speak against people, but uh, practices, Okay. So, but a lot of people will point to, uh, like a Beth Moore, who's a sister in Christ. I, I haven't met her, but um, I have used her Bible studies in the past. And because I know this is um, <laughs> being taped, uh, I, I was really encouraged, especially in college, by her Bible studies. Um, but um, there are some Bible teachers, well-known Bible teachers today, uh, have their, they have preached on a Mother's Day, for instance, or they've been invited by the pastors to preach. And when I say preach, I don't mean just proclaim the good news. I mean unpacking, you know, instructing, okay? And, and here's some of the reasons that I've heard, okay? So, some people say they're doing it under the authority of the pastor who invited them. Or they're doing it under the authority of their uh, their husband. You know, their husband said it was okay, so here. But here's what I say to that. If you determine, whoever the person is, that these are where the boundaries are, it doesn't matter if it's one time or a hundred times. If it's out of bounds, it's out of bounds. And can I tell you, it doesn't matter if your pastor says it's okay, because the truth is at the end, or your, you know, your husband, if you're married, they will be held accountable to God for how they've instructed. But here's the, at the end of the day, what's our authority? The Bible. So nothing trumps scripture. So um, just because a pastor says it's okay, before we listen to other people, we listen to the word of God, which is right there. Uh, and so I, I have been grieved by um, some of what is happening in, in, in churches today uh, and, 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 and so, yeah, I, did I answer your question? Okay. Then I'll have, since along those lines, uh, people will ask about, well, what about like the Passion Conference or um, something like that where you have men and women speaking to a mixed audience? Here's where that principle of wisdom comes into play and where I have to give an account for my own practices and, and obedience to the Lord, and, and I'm not supposed to be the whole Holy Spirit for other people, Okay. We didn't have passion conferences. We didn't have conferences like like this back in the, or that we know of back in the early church, okay? But if what's happening in a conference models church-like behavior, then I want to apply church-like principles to it, okay? So for me, I've been asked to speak at conferences before for mixed settings that are not in a church, okay? And not in a, where there's a pulpit or anything like that, you know, at a, at a, at a house or a conference center or something like that. And, and I have, cho- for me, chosen not to do that because I want to model church-like behavior. I'll give you a 
good example from my context. I was on a seminary faculty for uh, many years. I'm an adjunct here, but at the seminary faculty, we are training people for ministry, and we had chapel, okay? It's not ch church. It's, it was a worship service gathering, but it wasn't the local church, okay? So some people would say, well, a woman can and you know proclaim can instruct there and and I would say well it may not be explicit because the church doesn't talk about the seminary <laughs> okay but I think it's unwise because we're modeling something in that setting that we wouldn't want modeled in the church so uh, that's for me yeah go ahead no go ahead sure yeah, that's a great, and I actually was just discussing this with uh, someone the other day. So what for me, and this is good, for you, the application part, put it to your context, okay? I'll tell you how I worked that out. I, my degrees in theology, I could teach. I'm a credentialed to teach theology uh, at, 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 you know, at the highest level because of my degrees. I choose not to teach in a mixed setting uh, at seminary, not because I think I'm sinning, I don't think the Bible actually addresses that, but I've chosen not to do that because I want to model for, th it, this is for me, I want to model to people, because a seminary, for, we're preparing people for ministry, okay? Uh, so I choose not to teach theology classes to a mixed setting. I have been invited by, uh, when I, in Texas, I have been invited by my colleagues to address matters of church history. Uh, I, I do a lot with girls ministry, so I've, I've guest lectured in the class on that uh, before, because for me, it's not the, I don't have the great pause in my spirit about those subject matters as I do about theology. Now, I've had so many conversations one-on-one, -on -one, not one, you know, to, with, with guys in my office, the door open, that sounded weird, nothing questionable, okay? about the gender passages, because I've done a lot of work in that area, because I think I can point to a Priscilla Aquila moment <laughs> and, and feel right in my lane. But I, again, I don't think it's sinful for me to teach a theology class. I don't think you can say, like, you are sinning because the context of that pro, those prohibitions are the church. But for me, I, I, I choose not to because I'm modeling something I don't want reduplicated. So. That's for me. I have sisters that, that um, in the Lord that don't draw the line there, okay? But they'll have to answer the Lord for them, and I'll have to answer for me. <laughs> and, th and that's where I am now about that. So that's a great question. Get th did anything else on that? Follow up? Okay. All right. Okay. So how can we distinguish between Bible culture and normal Christian expectations for women? I can't remember now. I remember why you asked this question, but I can't remember who asked it. You don't have to say, say why. So the, she was getting to in this question the, Bible, the culture of the Bible, okay? What, how do we distinguish between what happened then and how we're to be faithful and biblically appropriate today? So the example of head coverings, okay? Uh, look at all you heathen women in here without head coverings. Uh, okay, she said she has hair. Um, how many of y'all, when you go to church, wear a head covering? You did growing up? Who said? Okay. Oh, you did growing up? Okay. Uh, I, I, um, I get to teach in Romania, uh, and, and it was just there in the fall. And in Romania, if I were married, in, in the churches that I'm ministering, they would, they would be offended if I didn't wear a head covering, okay? They, and their head covering, some of them, it's not a, you know, a whole wrap or shawl, but it could just be a headband like you have on. And um, when I was in Ukraine, I, brought, I always bring a scarf because some people, even if you're unmarried, want that. Some people think it's just for married. And so I bring it just in case. But I was teaching this class, and, uh, and they said, oh, no, it's okay. We don't wear that. And the very last day, they invited women from the community in. And I arrived to class, and all my students had been teaching all week who had not worn a head covering. I arrive on Friday, and those turkeys are all wearing head coverings because the women, you know, other women are there. And they didn't want to offend them, but they also did not give me a heads up. So I walk in, I'm like, this is going to be interesting. So um, there, there are some people today that apply 
that that uh, admonition in scripture too. So when they go to church, they wear a head covering. And, and so for me, I don't, and I'll tell you why. Understanding 1 Corinthians 11, this difference between a timeless application and a timely manifestation of that, okay? Whatever you understand a head covering to be, it was supposed to demonstrate a, something about your acceptance of your God-given roles. I'm, I'm summarizing because of time, and I want to get to all the questions, but go back and look at this on your own. Uh, a woman, when she was supposed to pray and prophesy, was supposed to engage in a ministry that was distinct from the way a man engaged in ministry. There are instructions for guys, too, there, okay? Uh, and so some people will say that wearing a wedding ring is, you know, is the equivalent today. I don't, I don't take that because when you walk in, here, I don't naturally assume something about your character because of your wedding ring, okay? If I walked in today with my head shaved, what might you think about me? What are some things? What, what do you think about it? I saw that look. <laughs> okay, I've had some mental meltdown like Britney Spears. What else may you think about me? Sickness? Who said sickness? Yeah, sickness. You may think I'm, I'm going through chemo or something like that, or there's some kind of sickness. What else may you think? You may think rebellion. What else may you think? Your hairstyle. I have style. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, some people just make the choice and can pull it off. I'm, I can feel the lumps in my head. I don't think I can pull it off. Um, but what you, you, you would think possibly some things would immediately come to your mind, but what probably wouldn't is you wouldn't immediately think I was a hooker, okay, or that I had been caught in adultery. In Paul's day in the first century, if a woman was um, a, a prostitute, often her head would be shaved. If a woman had been caught in adultery, uh, her head would be shaved. And so they would think something about her character based on her hair, okay? And so Paul is just saying when you engage in ministry, let your character qualities be reflected. So in that culture, being willing to wear a head covering was saying about submitting to your God-given role in the same way guys have instructions, okay? So I don't think wearing a, a, a wedding ring translates the same way, you know, that I think something about your character. But there are some ways in which we do ministry that does communicate that you're accepting. So for instance, I have been at a conference, and it was more what she said, but a woman was taking every opportunity to throw pot shots at the men around, um, or at her pastor. Even in her, her attitude was defiant. It reminded me of the Proverbs 7 woman. There's something about her character quality. And so um, uh, those, I don't, if you want to wear a head covering or a hat of some kind, uh, then more power to you. The same way that but I think the timeless manifest the timeless principle in there is engage in ministry in a way that shows you're accepting about God's role for you. Let me give you a couple others. When you walked in today, I was watching you, some of you, you didn't greet each other with a holy kiss. <laughs> I, I, you know, the Bible says greet each other with a holy kiss. In that culture, that would have been the way to express friendly, friendliness. In Brazil, that's how they still do it. I have a big personal bubble, okay? And, and uh, my bubble was popped so many times. And it was not just women. Like, it was men. And, and I was just like, oh, this is so uncomfortable. I, I mean, they were very eff effusive in their greetings, okay? And, and, and that was just the way they communicated. You're one of the family. And, and it, was, it was lovely and super uncomfortable. But there are other ways, right? When the Bible says to greet each other in a way that communicates love and friendly, there's other ways that we can do that in our culture today. And so the timeless principle is we still should be friendly when we see each other. We shouldn't just say, it's you, you know. That would be, I, I, I'm joking here, but that would be sin because the Bible says when we greet each other, it should be done in a certain way, okay? Now, whether the way I manifest that is with a holy kiss, uh, not anything lustful or, or anything. In some cultures, that would be appropriate. In some, it would be very inappropriate. And so you want to be appropriate in the culture that you're in. So the question is not much so much about Christian normal expectations. It's understanding how to faithfully apply the Bible in your contemporary context. I hope that answered your question. Okay, I've got three more in 15 minutes. Okay. 
Um, I think I answered that one. So the, this one is the position on women teaching scripture to men in the church. So I think I covered that with First Timothy 2. All right. Which one do I, I'm, uh, y'all can see which one I'm putting to the end. Okay. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, 2. All right. The husband of one wife. Go ahead and flip there if you want to. I mentioned it briefly earlier today. One wife at a time. Should it be, should a divorced man be a deacon? And, and let me actually read, because these are very similar questions, and it'll come up with the issue of divorce, okay? So in this particular question, it's asking how do you interpret the husband of one wife, okay, when it's talking about an overseer. But then also it says, should a divorced man be a deacon, okay? So we've got husband of one wife, deacon, is okay if they're divorced. And then what is your understanding of men in ministry and their wife who has been divorced? So this is not a deacon who's been divorced, but their wife, or some someone in a position of influence, so their wife has been divorced. I'm referring to scripture, which is good. So we should go to scripture about that. Let's start with 1 Timothy chapter 3 and look at verse 2. So the context here is talking about an overseer, a shepherd, a pastor, or some of you may understand that as an elder. If anyone aspires to be an overseer, he desires desires a noble work. An overseer, therefore, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, and it keeps going on and on, okay? My translation says husband of one wife. Does anyone have a different translation there? No? Okay. Uh, I, I love the, the nuance. I would translate it as a one-woman kind of man. <laughs> so, um, some people say, does it refer to having multiple, do you have something different? Faithful to his wife. That's the, that's the idea. So the faithfulness to the wife. Uh, one woman kind of, so it means you can't be a polygamist. <laughs> um, and, and, but, so what do we do in the issue of divorce? Now, this is an application question, okay? So some churches take this passage to mean that a man who is divorced um, that may have been then remarried, he's not a one-woman kind of man. He's actually had two wives, okay? And so they say a husband who's divorced uh, does not qualify biblically for, uh, to be in a church leadership role, okay? There are some churches that do not take that position. There are some that will say the faithfulness to the wife, so a man who's committed adultery. Like, it's important to, to as we're talking about this, um, let me just say this. If you've been impacted by any of the things that we're talking about today, God loves you, all right? All of us in here are sinners. We've all blown it, all right? Um, but we want to understand what God says about this, okay? So some people will say that it, if, if you haven't been faithful to your wife, then you are disqualified for this particular position in ministry, okay? That doesn't mean you can't do anything for the kingdom because pastor is not the only way to serve God, all right? There are many, 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 many ways to serve the Lord, okay? But this particular one, and I mean, if we go down through it, it says a lot of things about a man who should be a pastor. I think there are a lot of people in leadership roles that are actually disqualified today <laughs> by their life and their character. I, I don't, I, I just think, that, that happens in the church over and over again. So, um, the husband of one wife, I take it faithfulness to your wife. So, um, there, there is a, uh, I'm going to summarize because of time. To understand the issue of divorce, all right, whether it's you've been divorced, a church leader has a spouse who's been divorced, there are several passages that you have to consider in Scripture, Okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7 talks about it, and and um, it's now escaping me, but there's three passages that you have to look that I'm not recalling right off the top of my head, to be perfectly honest. Matthew 5, Matthew thank you. 19. Oh, good, Matthew. Okay, Matthew 5, Matthew 19, thank you, Dr. So it totally left me. Um, and then also Mark uh, talks about it as well, because people come up to Jesus, and we get several accounts in the Gospels, uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees want to trap Jesus, and so they ask him about divorce. And Malachi. he actually, and Ma- Malachi in the Old Testament said God hates divorce. So when we 
cover this topic, thank you, Dr. Dussault, we have to look at the whole of Scripture, okay, and what God's plan and purpose for marriage is. So Ephesians 5 also comes into play. Ephesians 5 tells us that marriage is supposed to be what? A picture of Christ in the church. And so when, when marriages are actually not ultimately about us, they're ultimately about the gospel. Every little marriage in here that's represented, you're supposed to be representing uh, little gospel pictures to the lost world, the way that you engage uh, in, in your marriage. So if you are divorced, you've experienced divorce, there's a, a lot of, when we get to the topic of divorce, a lot of what ifs and scenarios, okay? So um, here's my understanding of scripture and, and you look at it for yourself. I think biblically, Divorce, uh, if you think it's allowed, it's only allowed in cases of, um, the Bible uses the word porneia, which should sound a little familiar. It's where we get our word pornography. In Matthew 19, Jesus gives an exception clause. When people ask him if it's okay for a divorce, he says, uh, if, it's, if it's okay, it's only in cases of porneia sexual immorality. However, he says that the only reason Moses allowed this was because of the hardness of your heart. God's desire, Jesus' desire, he says, what uh, what God has joined together, let no man tear asunder. So because marriage is supposed to picture the way he relates to us, his goal is always reconciliation. That's, that's his goal, okay? But we live in a fallen world. You're a sinner and I'm a sinner, so divorces do happen. Um, so uh, if a divorce happens for any other reason other than sexual immorality, and some people wouldn't even draw the line there, but um, if it happens, if your spouse abandons you or, um, or, or, or whatever the scenario, if a, d- a divorce occurs in that scenario, 1 Corinthians 7 I think it's clear that you should not get remarried, okay? And you read this for yourself. I'm not saying this. The Bible says it, that if a man divorce, uh, marries a divorced woman, he's committing adultery. If a woman marries a divorced man, they're committing adultery. Because in God's eyes, that, that's still joined together. This is just in the issue of divorce. So in all of those scenarios, I, I say this, I know that this is probably personal for whoever has asked these questions. For me, I would probably not, I respect, I know people that are divorced that I love and respect, but I think a pastor who is divorced or, uh, and then remarries or has a wife who's divorced and then he marries her, I, I think they are out of bounds in that because the Bible says that remarriage is adultery. It, I, I didn't say it, the Bible said it, okay? I love y'all, I love you, whoever asked this question. Um, and so I, I, in, that, in that particular instance, I think because the, for, for the, we're to imitate, you know, that's why this leadership is not, um, you know, an extra calling, but there's a high calling because we're supposed to model our lives after those, Hebrews 13, 7, see the outcome of your leader's way of life and imitate them. Because there's that, you know, it's the same way if it, there sometimes people need to step out of ministry because of their home life, the children, you know, there's many, if you have an anger problem, like every pastor is, is a sinner, you're sinners, okay? But when there's a pattern or something in your life, um, I, I think it's a time to step out of ministry. Can God still use you? Yes, I know a, a, a godly mentor of mine, her dad uh, is a very well-known evangelist and he committed adultery. He cheated on his wife, they got divorced, and, and so uh, he, he repented and God used him mightily. He was a traveling evangelist, but he never resumed uh, a th- the pastoral role of a church any longer. God could still use him, but he made some choices. Listen, God forgives sin, but there are consequences for our sin, okay? So, um, and, and I think that's one of the consequences of this particular, I don't think it's the unforgivable sin. Sometimes we treat it that way in the church, but so I would say in those instances, um, then, then I, I would link, I would probably not join it, for me, join a church where the pastor has that as part of his past, okay? But it can be a godly man that you can learn from. He can do many things for the Lord, but not that particular role, okay? Um, 
And uh, I, I'll say this, I know, I know of a church, and if I said the name, you would know this man probably, who did get a divorce. His wife was unfaithful, and so he, was, he, he got divorced. And, um, and so they're saying that this is the biblical reason it's okay in this instant, and he chose not to remarry. So, he, so in that instance, that he's faithfully pastoring his church. Um, and, and so it's, it's without getting into deep particulars about your situation, I'm just giving you some general guidelines. This is different than um, this husband of one wife is different than uh, um, the faithfulness. If, if you are married and your husband dies and you get remarried, I think that's totally within bounds. Elizabeth Elliot, who I referred to earlier, we're going to close with this. She said, I have been married three times and have had three faithful, uh, wonderful husbands. And if people don't know her story, they kind of balk at that. But her first two husbands died, okay? Re- remarriage is allowed in each of those cases. As a matter of fact, Paul encourages young widows to remarry. So, um, but I hope that that's answered your question very quickly. I- I'll be around if anyone has some more questions. Feel free to email me. Amen.